God. But we're going to start in 2 Corinthians. So the name of the, the sermon this morning, Suit Up Ambassadors, okay? Suit Up Ambassadors. These are some of the props that we had um, from the last <clears throat> three, four weeks. Or I'm sorry, four or five weeks. And um, these are some I, I, I like using uh, visuals. I'm a big prop person. I, I enjoy them. They help us to uh, remember what was taught. And we're talking and teaching about the armor of God. So we're going to start with 2 Corinthians 5.20. And remember, we, we put the scripture on the screen so you can see it. It's not something that I'm making up or I'm saying. It's something that's foundational, biblical from God, God and uh, given to us by his apostles for teaching, edifying, educating, and helping us to stay on the path. And so, and then we also said this, um, when people hear um, the story, when we start teaching the, the scriptures, and I, I put this disclaimer out for everyone so we can understand this, and that is don't forget that this is the written word of God, and God um, is the one who, who put this out for us to understand it, to educate us. So with that said... With that said, and, and then I also tell people, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit, don't wear it. What does it mean? Is if things are, come to you and they're like, oh, that's offensive. Well, remember, it's the word of God. And maybe it's something that he's challenging us with. Maybe it's something that he's, he's trying to sift out of our lives. Maybe it's something that he's trying to encourage us to do. But no matter what it is, remember, we want to be able to, to be putting that armor on and telling, okay, Lord, whatever you say, any direction, what are you trying to sift out of my life, Lord? And remember, we want to walk in his presence. So we're start, starting in 2 Corinthians 5.20. This is reading from the NIV here. So we're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So biggest thing is, what does this mean? And then if we go to the next screen, we bring down the meanings of this. So Paul's mission <clears throat> is his work, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Paul's mission in life was that his work given to him by the Lord was to take the message of reconciliation, so the Bible is a, rest, a message of reconciliation with God to as many people as possible. So God has called us, and here the apostles saying, you're God's ambassadors. So your definition a little bit further. Example, just as a political ambassador lives in a foreign land representing the interest of their homeland, Christians are to represent Jesus and his message to the world. So each and every one of us, God calls us what? Ambassadors. So he says, I want you to represent me in whatever you're doing. So I thought it was just so appropriate as our young adults are going out they, they are representing, of course, their parents, but most important, they're representing themselves, but they're representing Jesus Christ. So when they go into the colleges and they go into, on their journey, they're representing Jesus Christ. They're ambassadors. So what they say, what they do, makes a difference. And let's take it. I want to talk about it internal. I want to talk about their journey. But I want to talk about our journey here also in the sanctuary, in these four walls, but God's message is intended to stay in these four walls. As we go outside of these four walls and we take the message of God and we're in his ambassadors, how are, we, how are we supposed to act? What are we supposed to do? So remember, we talked about the last five weeks about the armor of God and how we need to put it on and how it's important. Now, again, in conclusion, we're talking about, yes, we're ambassadors. Yes, he expects us to represent him. Yes, he expects us to rent, represent him by putting the armor on. And he says he, he's going to walk with us and he's going to help us fight this fight. So just for a recap, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And he says, put on the full armor. Again, Paul's using the armor as an example, so that you can take your stand. So he doesn't say that um, we're supposed to run. He says we're supposed to take our stand against the devil's schemes. So the most important thing, if you remember the first time that I was teaching this in verse 10, 
we were saying this is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual fight. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And going way back five weeks ago, we started talking about Saul and saw how Saul went back and he was seen looking for a sorcerer because the kingdom of God was pulled from his hands. So he went to go see a witch, a warlock actually, or a witch, and he was talking to her and asking her, hey, um, I need to talk to somebody here and God's not talking to me. So he was trying to go through the back door. So I'm not going to get into all that, but uh, we use that example to show you that there is a good and a bad. There is a heaven and a hell. There is a, a, a light and a dark. So Paul was going through the back door, and this whole thing that the Apostle Paul is saying, Saul, sorry, the Apostle Paul is saying this, is our struggles are against something that we can't see, and it's not against another human being, but maybe who, who they're serving or who they're submitted to. We talked about picking up we put a spirit of offense, and if, if we're offended in life, if we're angry, we go through life and we're, we're offended. You pick up a spirit of offense and that spirit comes with it. And pretty soon that spirit is affecting how you think, how you receive things from people. You're angry when this woman sits down or this man sits down. You have the spirit of offense and, and you're, you're bitter. <clears throat> now I want to go a little bit lateral with this. Uh, being a pastor... You do a lot of marriage counseling, you do a lot of counsel counseling, a lot of counseling with parents and kids. <clears throat> the biggest thing that the commonality when we're doing marriage counseling is there's one common thing for marriage is we're one team. Husband and wife, it says you become one with who? With Jesus Christ. And it says it's like a three-chord strand intertwined, but you become one. But what happens when marriage couples come with uh, to us and they're, they need counseling or their marriage is falling apart. I gave you the example probably about three weeks ago about a couple that I sat with who had all their marriage papers filled, or divorce papers filled out. And after, it was about four months, five months of marriage counseling, they, were, they were, tore them up the day before, it was three months, because before it became final. And they said, you know, we are gonna let God heal this marriage and we're, we're gonna stay married. It was the power of God who healed them and brought them together and knitted them back together. Beautiful. <clears throat> so here's where I'm going with this. We turn around and the commonality over was counting over 50, 60 couples that we've we had the privilege to um, come alongside of them and, and have counseling was this. They become different teams. It's, it's husband versus wife. It's wife versus husband. There's no unity anymore. There's no one team. God, they never either never wove them in or, or, or pushed them out. And then you watch this division, and they're against each other. Well, if he would just do it, if she would just do it, and they're angry at each other, and they forgot, they forgot that they're one team. Okay? Now, I'm going to carry this over to a church. As a church, we're one team. We're one God, one body, one family. Well, look how difficult it is for a husband and wife to be a one team, right? Tracy, you can tell us later how difficult it is, okay? <laughs> Not now. <clears throat> so we find out how difficult it can be, but all of a sudden you bring a body of people and you say, we're going to be one body. It's like a marriage because even the Bible says God, <coughs> Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. The church is the bride. But now we're coming together and we're saying different personalities. We have different cultures. We were raised up in, different, in a different way. And we're saying, well, everybody just play nice and just love each other. Good luck with that, right? Good luck with that. Because you come together as a church body and we're all different and we're all wound different and we come together. And again, I've given you that analogy for marriage counseling. They forget they're one. They forgot they're one team that they're on the same team. So if her, if her husband is losing, she's losing. If, if the wife is losing, he's losing. So as a church body, if people are wounded or hurting, you know, we're losing. And we want to make sure that we're one body, one accord, one spirit. You know, and some of that 
comes with saying, hey, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry I didn't know I was offending you. But if you carry around that spirit of offense, it doesn't matter what anyone says. They can say good morning to you, and you're offended because I just can't stand being in the same room. I'm offended. And, and we turn around. But remember what it says here. It's a spiritual warfare. So if you're carrying extra luggage called the spirit, and you have the spirit tormenting you, and you can't stand being around the person, I can't stand sitting at the table, remember who we serve. And the apostle Paul is calling it out, saying, hey, you know what? We're going to fight the spiritual warfare. Verse 12, our struggles are not against flesh and blood. He said, listen, you're not looking at this man or this woman. He said, our struggles are against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in this dark world, and against the spiritual forces and evil and heavenly realms. He said, that's your battle. That's your battle. So really, you know, there's, if we turn around and we look at this house right here, is this house spiritually, is it biblically in order? Am, am I submitting my life, my will, my thoughts? And then we, we go on, and again, I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians 5.20. What are you? Ambassadors of Christ. We're ambassadors of Christ. So if you're ambassadors of Christ, number one, your house needs to be in order. It's, your house needs to be in order. Matter of fact, when they call elders to be elders or someone to go into pastor, pastorship, your house needs to be in order. The first thing, right up, your house, your home. Is your home prayed over? Is, is prayer the first thing that we come up and, Lord, I'm, I'm talking to you this morning. I'm inviting you into this home. I'm inviting to you into this home too, Lord. And, and am I walking in his spirit and his will? Number one. Number two, when's, men, when's the last time you prayed over your wife? You took your wife's hand and said, let me just pray for you real quick before we start our day. It's called spiritual authority, spiritual responsibility. Ladies, when's the last time you said, hey, I want to turn around and I just want to pray over you, man of God. I want to pray over you. And I want to take some time and I want to pray with you and pray over you. Why is, that, why is that important? Because we're ambassadors of God. We're representatives of God. And if I'm going to send my wife out, I want to make sure she's prayed up, prayed over. If I'm going to be sent out, I want to make sure I'm prayed up, prayed over. It starts in your home. And we said, put on the helmet. Put on the shield. Put up the sword of God, the word of God. Put on the belt of truth. We start thinking of all these things. But boy, right when we get up in the morning, we're so busy to go out, get out at the door, we forget. Man, I don't have any armor on. I didn't even take five seconds. And maybe at first it's awkward because you haven't done it before, but there's no beautiful, no more intimate intimacy that you can have with your spouse and say, you know what? I want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you before you leave the door. I want to pray for you in the armor of God. I want to pray a hedge of protection over you. You know why? Because I love you, because I care about you. I want to pray for you. That's a pretty important thing. Because I want to help you suit up before you walk out that door. So, we're ambassadors for Christ. John, if you can follow with me, John, this is from the New King James Version, 414. So, whoever drinks of the water... <clears throat> that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, this is wonderful. If you remember, this comes from the scripture when Jesus meets the woman at the well. When she comes up and she had four or five different husbands and suggests she's a, a, a loose woman, and she comes up and Jesus, he, he didn't have to take that journey uh, that he took, actually it's recorded that he went 7.4 miles out of the way to make this appointment with this woman at the well and she comes out and he's talking to her and, and he's sharing the word of God to her and he's reading her mail. He knows all this history about her and she's like, ah, oh my gosh, he knows that I had five husbands and, and, and that I've been sleeping around and, and, he's and this is where the scripture comes from and it goes on. But whoever drinks of the water, he's referring to, to his living water, and he goes on, will never thirst. But the water that I have give him will become in him a fountain of water. Now, what does that mean? 
So, all right, next we got the meanings up here. What's the meaning of John 4.14? 4, Salvation is neither obtained nor kept through works. What does that mean? Salvation is a gift from God. There's nothing you have to do or nothing you can do to get it. It's a gift from God. All you got to do is say, Lord, I'm right here. And in Revelation, it says that he's knocking at the door of our hearts, waiting to, for us to come in, waiting for us to come in. So it's a free gift. What is the spiritual meaning of living water? A symbol for salvation and a true knowledge of God. I went down to the second sentence. A symbol for salvation and a true knowledge of God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So it's a sign. So we become Christians. We ask God, Lord, I want you to be in my life. I want you to walk with me. Goes on, last one. What does it mean to be spiritual thirsty? When we're longing for the Holy Spirit to work in our spirits. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to explain this a little bit more. So he's saying in John 4, 14, but the water that I shall give you will become in him a fountain of water. He's saying this, this word of God that, that we're hearing, it should be bubbling up in us. It should be like, man, you know what? I'm, I'm walking in his peace. I'm learning how to forgive people. I'm learning how to love people like I never loved people before. I, I'm, I'm walking in his spirit. I'm walking in his presence. And there's nothing you can do. And this is what this is what's, what's so neat. There was about 20% of, of our old church of 500 people plus that, that were from recovery. And, and I shared this before. Some have come from, from heroin. Some have come from opiates, some have come from meth, different addictions, and, and they had tried all different forms of recovery and not being successful. But I watched, I, I watched when they would submit their lives and they accepted Christ to come in, the spirit that they had, they had in them was bubbling up. And this is what he's saying, it's living water, it shouldn't be stale. And the word of God should be bubbling up. It should be like, man, this is good stuff. I'm, and I'm getting this. And I'm feeling his peace. I'm feeling his peace. But folks, you know, here's the thing. We could be Christians, but we can also be imposters. We can also be imposters. You can come to church. You can sit in the pews. You can sit in the church. You can go through everything. And you can have an, an, an ugly spirit. But, but you look like everyone else. But we can have an ugly spirit. See, when we start looking at the word and it's revealed and it's a living water, that living water bubbles up. It's like an artesian well, never stops. It just keeps bubbling up and it's fresh water. And that's the word of God. It's fresh water. It's a spirit. It's living. And this is what he's saying. Hey, this is living water. This is what he's telling the women. He's saying, she says, well, I'm thirsty. He said, listen, that, that water, that's going to quench your thirst, but you want to have some water that's going to last you forever and get you into eternity? And once you catch a hold of this, you can teach it to your kids. And especially like today, we're having our kids who are, who are graduating, going out. Guess what? That's that living water. That's that bubbling well. That's, it has to be bubbling up inside of you. And if it's not bubbling up inside of you, you don't have that peace of God, you're missing it. You're just attending church but you're doing it without the spirit of the living God. And that's what he's saying. That spirit of the living God, I, I, know how to, I know how to reach for his peace. I know how to reach for his forgiveness. And sometimes we need to forgive ourselves. Sometimes we've done things or thought things that we need to forgive ourselves. And when we start seeing this and, and the word becomes life, it becomes life, it'll change your destiny. James chapter 3 James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done, and the humility that comes from wisdom. So he's talking about spiritual wisdom. Now, we're not suggesting in any way that we're, we do works to get into heaven. We talked about that earlier, that it's only by the grace of God that he, he comes upon us. But here it says, let them... <clears throat> Show by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from the wisdom. Verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. But such wisdom does come from down, 
from the heaven, but an earthly spiritual demonic. Let me see it, read it again. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So he's saying, listen, there's two different wisdoms. You can get a wisdom from the Holy Spirit, and it says it's humble and it's enlightening, and it's not of self and selfish ambition, but we're one body. But he's saying if that wisdom, he goes, but there's another wisdom. There's another wisdom, but that wisdom is demonic, and he tells you what it looks like. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Let's go all the way back up to Ephesians 6. We don't fight against one another. We fight a warfare that's spiritual. So here's the question. What spirit are you carrying, right? I either have the spirit of God or I have a spirit of the world. There's one or the other. And here's a scripture that lays it out saying, hey, hey, as a church body, I guarantee you, and as a church body, there's some of us in here. At one time, that was in my life. So we have to say, you know, and this is what about God. His word sifts that junk out of our lives. His word sifts that junk out of our lives. And he wants us to be more in his image and more in his likeness. That's a beautiful thing. That's what the word does. It's like a bubbling, a bubbling fountain. And that's where it went back in the scripture where it says, hey, you know what? That word is bubbling. So if you wake up in the morning and you get up and your alarm clock wakes you up and you go to work and you work all day and you come back and then you have supper or maybe it's so busy, I just got to go out to eat. If you think that's what life is, at one time I was so depressed. I mean, this is my life. I'm just going to come in, I'm going to eat, I'm going to run out the door. Hi, hon, see you later. I'm going to go to work and I'm come back and I'm going to do it all over again. There's no satisfaction in that. There's zero. Zero. But there's satisfaction knowing I wake up with the spirit of the living Lord in my life. And it's bubbling in my life and it's bubbling in my spirit. So when I turn around and I feel the power of God, and I feel his presence, man, that's rewarding. I'm not just waking up and punching a clock and just going to work. I'm carrying around this living fountain in my life, and, and the Lord is in my life, and I'm not just going through life, man. I'm living it. I'm feeling good. I have the peace, and God says, hey, by the way, you're my ambassador, so make sure you have that helmet on. Make sure you put that shield up. Make sure you put that belt of truth, and, and don't forget, the most important, when you pull that sword, the sword of the word, make sure you know where you're pulling it from. He says, I, I'm equipping you, I'm telling you, Paul's saying, but he says, be, be ready for the fight. But then we learn in James 3 that there's imposters. There's imposters. It's saying, there's imposters. And he's saying, hey, there's wisdom from heaven? But he says, hey, there's also wisdom from hell. There's both. Goes on. Verse 16. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder. What is it? Disorder and evil practice. He's saying, hey, it's going to be evident. It's going to show up in your disorder. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Then peace, loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. How do you know what spirit you have? Let me ask you this. Is the spirit that's flowing through you, is the spirit that you have, does it have these things? Is it pure? Is it peaceful? Is it loving? Is that spirit that flows through you considerate? Is it submissive? Is it full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere? Because if it's not, then we have to do an evaluation and say, you know what? Man, I, I, can, I can check a few of these, but I don't know if I'm so much submissive. As long as it's my way, it's fine. But is it submissive? Is that spirit that I'm carrying around because I'm an ambassador of God? Because I'm called out to put on the armor of God and represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is that spirit that I have, is the spirit that I'm showing, 
Is it pure? Is it peaceful? Is it considerate? Is it submissive? Does it show mercy? Does it have good fruit? Is it impartial? Is it sincere? Wow. More Lord, this is a list. I didn't sign up for all this. But this is what it means to be a follower of God. This is what it means. And this is what, this is what I, I just love this. And it keeps going over my head. The woman at the well. She was sinning. Jesus said, hey, I know what happened in the past. But he says, I, I can forgive that. I can equip you. I can restore you. And I can put you on the path. And, and I've watched the worst alcoholics, the worst drug addicts, I've watched these people come through this, and I've watched them surrender to the power and authority of God, and I've watched them to, to line up their lives with the gospel, and I've watched them come in victory and conquer drugs and conquer alcohol, and I've seen marriages that you thought, man, this marriage is never going to work. And I gave a story, true story, of a couple that I met right over here in Boone, and even if it was in Ogden, it'd be in Boone. We always play Boone. You never, you never <laughs> poop or you sleep, see? So Ogden, we're all angels over here. but never happen here. But that Boone, phew, watch out. So here's the thing. In Boone, now I'm making fun of that. <clears throat> the big thing is, in recap, marriage, husband and wives, same team. Unified husband and wife in Jesus Christ. Church body, unified, same team. So if we have division, if we have, if we have division, we got a problem. We're not unified. We're not one body. The bride, fighting with the bride is crazy. Not biblical. Okay, let's move on. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5. I'm going to start in verse 3 or 4. For the weapons, again, it sounds like Ephesians 6, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So here's what it's saying. He's saying, listen, you're supposed to put this armor on, but you're not supposed to do nothing. It's, it's used for spiritual battle. It's used to pull down strongholds. It's used to have victory. It's not so you can sit on your can. He's saying, hey, we're going to get busy. We're going to pull down strongholds. God says, but not by yourself. But not by yourself. Verse 5. This goes to every household. This goes to every church across the country. Casting down arguments and, every hot <clears throat> and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity and into obedience of God. Well, that's exactly the scripture we're talking about when we start talking about the, the helmet. When we start talking about the helmet, it's saying, and it's giving an example, it's going over the head, saying, hey, every thought that comes in my head, that comes out of my mouth, it needs to be what? Captured. I shouldn't be releasing poison out of my mouth to, to hurt another human being. And I sure shouldn't be releasing poison out of my mouth about another human being. It doesn't line up. It's not biblical. And, and if, if we're doing it, and you're coming up here and saying, well, I'm a Christian, and I, I come to church, that's good. And I, know, and I know the Bible. Satan knew the Bible. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus Christ in the desert. He knew it verbatim. He had it memorized. But he was still Satan. So when we started seeing this, he's saying, hey, listen, when we start putting it together, it's powerful. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the spring of water, spring of life. Put away from you a deceitful, lying, misleading mouth. And put devious lips far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead toward the path of the moral courage. And let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you toward the path of integrity. Consider well and watch carefully the path of your feet. I love this scripture. And my pastor used to say, always used to say this, keep your eyes on the cross. Remember Pastor Balkan, keep your eyes on the cross. 
And, and I'm like, well, come on, man, say something more than that. Keep your eyes on the cross. But as I started growing in the Word, he's saying, hey, keep your eyes on the Word of God. Don't forget who died for your sins. Don't forget the one who set your feet. Keep your eyes on the cross. Keep fixed on that. And, and then he's saying, you know, then what comes out of your mouth and the integrity and how you live. And then, and then this, this wonderful man of God, he said to me, he goes, you know, he says, Rob, he goes, it's not just how you live your life. It's how you live your thought life. And I'm thinking, man, I'm just figuring out how to live my life. Now you want to come upstairs? And he's saying, every thought that comes in your mind that God can hear and God can see and is my thoughts against my fellow man are my, my thoughts harmful or are they ugly? So wait a minute, God. It was, it was hard enough that you told me how to control this shell, but now you're going interior. You're going in, Sarah. You're going upstairs. Don't go up there, God. You ain't going to like it. You ain't going to like it because you don't know how much, but you know what? That's why he's saying capture those thoughts. If I'm, if I'm a funky monkey and I'm thinking wrong, Hey, God said, that's not okay, funky monkey. Think right. Capture those thoughts. And, and think right. Keep your, your, your mind biblically aligned. Keep it aligned. Capture those thoughts. And the, the word, I get so excited about it. It's so good. It's so real. And, and you start seeing this like, man, I, I should try some of this sometime. Philippians 4, 1 through 9 Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord and his way, dear friends. He's saying, stand firm. He's telling you, listen, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight. And you know what? Sometimes that fight will start right in your house, right with the ones you love. And pretty soon, you're, you're, you're like, ah, who invited her to live here anyway? You know, what's going on? And that battle's right there. And then sometimes you take that, and you take that battle into your workplace. And, and, and you forgot, man, you know what God's saying? I've given you the power. You didn't put the helmet on. You know, you're not loving her like I love her. Or you're not forgiving her like I forgive her. And you start putting the scripture, and this is why it's so important, to our graduates, to our parents, to visitors, everyone sitting right here, here's why. Because you're going to march. You're going to go out. God said, you're my ambassador. You're the one who's representing me. You're the one. And here's another thing I was thinking. I'm in the office before service listening to their, their young voices. Now, I'm not trying to cut on you, Amber. They're young voices. Young voice sounds different than an older voice. And I listen to her young voices and all these young voices. And I'm thinking, wow, Lord, these are, are young warriors. These are young warriors, Lord, getting ready to start their journey. These are young warriors getting ready. And, and both, both men and young women, they're getting ready to start their journey. And, and I'm listening to their voice. I'm thinking, wow. So church... Our responsibility is the bride, get along. Our responsibility of the bride, be one of cord. And for our, our, our youth, would you stand up for me, all of our young adults, if, if you're, yeah, just stand up. Not just our graduates, all of our young adults, stand up. If you, don't think, if you think you're still a toddler, that's different. But young adults, stand up. Just stand up. <clears throat> okay, just stand up for a second. I, I want to speak directly to you. I want to say something to you, okay? And I want you to grab it. When Jesus was attacked by Satan in the desert, his encounter, he took a stance, okay? So Satan came, Jesus in there. He was led by the Spirit of God into the desert. And then Satan came along, and he starts to tempt him. So guess what? When you go on your journey, you're going to be tempted. When you go on your journey, someone's going to talk to you and more than likely a human being, and they're going to come. What spirit is inside of them? What spirit are you listening to? Not just the per person, what spirit are you listening to? And it goes on. When Jesus was attacked by Satan in the desert, this encounter, he took a stance. Satan attacked Jesus Christ. He countered. He countered, this is the way. The word of God is to encourage it's to strengthen, 
it's sometimes it'll be to correct. Okay, stay standing here for a minute. Sometimes your parents aren't going to be around. Other people from church aren't going to be around. So sometimes you're going to have to tell yourself. Sometimes you're going to have to tell yourself this. Number one, tell yourself, Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Isaiah 54, maybe I need to hear that. Or tell yourself, Deuteronomy 28, I am the head, not the tail. Psalms 18, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Sometimes you're going to have to tell yourself, Psalms 20, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I remember the name of the Lord. I remember what was taught. I remember what was poured inside of me. And I'm going to say yes to what's right and honoring, and I'm going to say to no to what's not. I'm going to tell myself, because you know what? You're not going to be around mom and dad all the time. You're not going to have someone to hold your hand. You're going to have to stand up and be a warrior, and you're going to have to be a man and a woman of God, and you're going to have to tell yourself. We have some adults here. Are we telling ourselves this? Are we submitted to his will, to his forgiveness? Is his likeness in us? Are we imposters? When we look at this beautiful word, tell yourself, Romans 8.37, we're no more, we're conquerors through him who loves us. That's Jesus Christ. Romans 8.31, God is before me, who can stand against me? No one. So really, you're equipped. You're equipped to go. You're equipped to be successful. You're equipped to say yes and no. But just like the Spirit of God took Jesus Christ and he walked him to the desert. He walked him to the desert. And he took him into the desert. And Satan says, hey, let's talk. Uh, and he starts quoting scripture to him over and over and over. And Jesus turns around and he defends himself. You can sit down. Thank you. And Jesus Christ defends himself. Jesus Christ defends the word. Rhonda, why don't you come up here real quick? Okay. Why don't you hand these out? So we're giving away this morning, Mr. Darren. You put it in your pocket. And these are just, <clears throat> these are our medals, and these are symbols for you to remember this sermon. And reach over you. And these are symbols to remember these grueling last six weeks. And she's going to make sure everyone gets one this morning. Oops, sorry. So I'm going to close in prayer. Let's stand together. Oh, grab me my water right there. Thank you. Yes. And we're going to worship together. <coughs> let's, let's close. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a special day. Lord, and as you birth this, this message, Lord, in my spirit for the church body, for these young men and young women who start their new adventure, the new journey, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, you, you put this in my spirit. Sometimes we need to tell ourselves who we serve, but all the time we're responsible for what comes out of our mouth. So that means we need to make sure our heart is right and our heart is submitted to you. Lord, it's obvious when you listen to people what spirits they struggle with. Lord, help that come to our mind. Lord, help us to submit them to your authority. We ask you for victory over that battle in our heads. Lord, we ask that you just honor, honor our each and every one, Lord. Equip them, Father. Cover them with your Holy Spirit and your, your refuge, Lord. We ask that you cover our young adults, our young men, young women, Lord, as they, they go through their journey, Lord. You're their, you're their fortress, Lord. You're their solid rock. Lord, we love you. 
We place them in your care. In Jesus' holy name, amen.